Greetings, everybody. I'm glad to see each of you. Uh, glad to be together uh, with you all tonight. I um, I wanted to get I wanted to have a a meeting tonight, kind of a back to basics. I want to talk about something from the Sermon on the Mount. If you want to open with me to Matthew chapter five. I want to talk about uh, truth-telling as a kingdom requirement. So let's, let's read together in Matthew 5, starting in verse 33. Again, you have heard that it has been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oath. But I say unto you, swear not at all. Neither by heaven, for it's God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool. Neither by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. I... um, I can't see you if I have my glasses on. I can't see my Bible if I have my glasses off. So, I, uh, I come to this conviction early in my Christian experience. And um, I don't know a lot of other people who started their kingdom journey with not swearing oaths. But you see, the very last fist fight that I got in before I was a Christian, I was arrested for. And after I became a Christian, I, um, I, I had already, this, this had happened, I was actually supposed to appear in, I, I was supposed to appear for an arraignment for an assault charge. Um, and when I showed up to court, there was no, I wasn't on the docket. Uh, this was, uh, it, it happened, it was probably a year after this fight happened. Um, I was now married, and I was now a brand new Christian, and I showed up at court having no idea what was going to happen. And when I showed up to, at, the, at the clerk at the court to say, my name's Matthew Milioni, I'm here, I was told to be here, they said, you're not on the docket. And I said, well, what does that mean? And they said, well, I don't know, but you don't have to be here today. And I was like, well, what does that mean? And they said, well, sometimes if the, if the DA doesn't want to prosecute, then then they just will remove the name from the docket and you don't have to be here. So when I first, so the, the issue that, what, that was with that is that the statute of limitations on that charge was like six or seven years. I remember celebrating when Hannah was five or six years old and uh, the statute of limitations on my assault charge ran up. Like that was a big day, like hooray, let's have a cake. I don't have to go to jail. Um, <laughs> But all those years when I became serious about the Word of God, when I began to really study the Scriptures and especially wanted to understand Jesus' teachings, I came across this particular passage. And, and because I was so close to the legal system on the wrong side of it, every time I read this, this passage, I thought about, like, I don't know if you remember the old TV shows, you, you, they used to have a witness stand up front and Perry Mason was there doing whatever and they would, have the, they would say, raise your right hand and put your hand on the Bible. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth will help you God? They were still doing that stuff when I was a kid. And every time I read this swearing of oaths, I thought of a witness stand with a hand on a Bible and your hand in the air saying, I swear to tell the truth. And I was befuddled because I was like, why does... Why does Jesus tell me not to do that on a witness stand? What's that got to do with with Jesus? What does that have to do with the kingdom? And I could have maybe put it off, but then in the end of John's epistle, he says, above all little children, swear not. Like it just comes out of nowhere. And I couldn't let go of this. I wanted to understand it. And so from early in my Christian life, I've really looked at this text and tried to understand what Jesus is trying to tell us. And why he goes through the trouble of forbidding the swearing of oaths and what this means. I've read commentaries about it. I've read what it was in the ancient world. I've read lots of stuff over the years about the swearing of oaths. And it's particularly interesting interesting in Europe in the Middle Ages. 
I developed convictions around this, and um, quite a few years ago, uh, I was working downtown, and I came out from work, um, and my truck was towed by the city of Boston. And I was upset because I had permission to be there, like I was where I was supposed to be, and somebody came by and towed my truck. And so when I, I went and got my truck out of Hawk, I walked across town to get my truck out of Hawk, and, uh, and then I had a ticket, and so I was gonna appear, not because I was worried about the 50 bucks, but because it was unrighteous, like I didn't deserve a ticket for that. So I go downtown, I go into City Hall, in, into that big building downtown, and I wake, make my way through that building, and I sit down in a back office somewhere with a delegate of the judge. He's not a judge, he was just some appointed person from the court to deal with me with my appeal to my ticket. And he's sitting down at his desk and he says, are you Matthew Milioni? I say, yes, and he says, are you here for this ticket? And I say, yes, and he says, do you swear to tell the truth? And I said, no. <laughs> and he said, he went right on past it and then had to back up and say, wait, did you just say no? And I said, yes, I, I'm, I'm, I don't swear oaths. And he's like, he had the most confused look on his face. I felt so bad for the guy. He could not understand. I said, I'm a Christian and Jesus says these things. I quote this text to him and he just is shaking his head and he said, are you telling me that you're going to lie to me? And I said, no, I'm telling you the opposite. And he said, so will you swear an oath? And I said, no, that's the point. And it was confusing for both of us. <laughs> he finally said, listen, are you going to tell me the truth? And I said, yes. And he said, that's enough. <laughs> as interesting as those things are, and I think they're worth doing, I don't think that's the central thesis of what Jesus is after. It is an application, but it's not the central thesis, and I, I'd like to talk more about that. You know, another time, uh, David and Hannah, when they went to get their marriage license, had a lot of trouble. And what's always interesting to me is why those things still matter. Like, it, it seems kind of vestigial. It seems like this relic from a bygone era that there's even something called swearing bows. Like, they don't really do that. They don't do the Bible raise your hand thing on witness stands. But it's still, there's these places where it's still present, where it, it really like upsets the apple cart if you don't go along with this premise that everyone just kind of does by default. And, and that's interesting to me for a lot of reasons. Like I was always interested when I read about martyrs in, um, or confessors in, you know, behind the Iron Curtain or in China, and they would have these puppet courts. And I would read these stories about some puppet court in Romania where a Christian brother was going to be persecuted and exiled into some horrible prison camp. And, but they would go through all the trouble of a trial. Like they would pull him out of a, a prison cell where he'd been beaten up and he'd show up in black eyes and he'd actually sit at a table with someone called a lawyer and someone called a judge and someone called a prosecutor. And all of this would happen. And I always wondered, why do they bother? Why do they bother going through the motions of that when, when everybody, the prisoner, the, the, the defense attorney, the prosecuting attorney, the judge, everybody knows what's going to happen. Why do they bother? There's something about these customs that's deeply rooted. We have a sense of feeling like it, we have to go through the motions. And, and this feeling of having to go through the motions is very much a part of what this is about, this swearing of oaths is about. It, it, it is really how society was run, especially in a pre-literate world, especially when there wasn't a document that you could sign as a contract and everybody could take it before lawyers. In a pre-literate world especially, this is a terribly important thing. I, I can't stress to you how, I'll, I will stress to you how important it was with some quotes, but in, in a lot of people from the ancient world to the Middle Ages, saw the swearing of O's as a necessary component to keeping society functional. Menno said, <clears throat> um, if you fear the Lord, Menno Simon said this, if you fear the Lord and are asked to swear, continue in the Lord's word which, ha which has forbidden you so plainly to swear, and let your yea and nay be your oath as commanded. Whether life or death be your lot, in order that you, by your courage and firm truthfulness, may admonish and reprove others. 
See, this wasn't a small thing in that world, in a world that was, was held together by the swearing of oaths. It was, it was something that people, um, people lived and died by. A lot of the faithful Christians in the 15th and 16th century paid great prices for this. And I always, my friends in the Anabaptist communities, I would always talk to them and say, do you think you would make the same choices that those guys made? Like, if they came and they knocked on your door and they, they, they pulled your baby out of your house and they said, you either have to let us baptize your baby or we're going to kill you and then we're going to baptize your baby anyhow, how many of you would say no? If they came to you and they said, this is the annual swearing of oaths where you have to swear fealty to your Lord in this, in this particular municipality, and you would choose to have your two fingers cut off of your hand, because this was the oath posture, you, they would cut the two fingers off if you would refuse to swear an oath or if you broke an oath. That was a, a, a common punishment. There were a lot of, I don't know how many, but there were some eight-fingered Anabaptists because their fingers had been cut off because they refused to swear an oath. If, if the world was run that way, would you be willing to make that kind of sacrifice for that kind of premise? And this is how important it was to those brothers and sisters, and not just among the Anabaptists, but in the early church as well. The Quakers, after the Anabaptists, also paid serious uh, costs for their commitment not to swearing of oaths. Uh, In fact, it was William Penn who pushed in Pennsylvania in the new territory to make affirming a legally binding thing instead of swearing of an oath. I think often, you know, in current terms, when I think about swearing of oaths, the place that my mind usually runs to is the playground. And it's, a, it's instructive for a few reasons, because uh, where, I, where I grew up, the way that oaths worked was when your buddy, who was not n- known for not being the most truthful person, came with a big story to the playground, you would say, no, that's not true. And he would say, I swear it's true. And you'd say, no, I don't believe you. And he'd say, I swear on my mother's grave, it's true, I promise. And somehow, I don't know who taught us that, I don't know why we did that, but somehow that verified the statement. So, so Billy might be a liar most times, but you judged him as caring enough for his mother that if he swore on his mother, that then he was probably telling the truth. And, and as silly as that scenario is, it actually gets pretty close to the truth of what Jesus is trying to deal with. And what he's trying to deal with is the substitute honor. There's two, there's two issues at play with the swearing of an oath. It's a substitute honor. Like, I might not be telling you the truth, but you, we, you and I have enough common value for the temple, or for heaven, or for the gold of the temple, or for my mother, or whatever we're sacrificing in the oath, potentially, that we're going to agree that both of us hold that important enough that you'll believe what I'm saying. So that substitute honor, I'm, I, you, you can't believe me, but you can believe that I care about the temple, or you believe that I care about my mother. And so for their sake, not for my sake, for their sake, you'll believe what I'm saying. And that issue of substitute honor is more pervasive than we might think still today. The second problem that Jesus is trying to deal with, so in the first case he says swear not, in the latter case he says let your communication be yea, yea, and nay, nay. The second issue that Jesus is dealing with is that his disciples should not have two patterns of truth-telling. There should not be one way that we communicate under oath and another way that we communicate not under oath. There's only supposed to be one way that we communicate. And the way that all of us as disciples communicate is based on truth. That what we say is what we mean, and what we mean is what we say. All the way, all the way back in, um, in, the, in the Greco-Roman world, Lycurgus, who was known as the founder of Sparta and the lawgiver, He said, the oath is the bond that maintains democracies. 
a way of holding everybody to the same standard, regardless of how honest they were, was the point. And in these old, in, in, the, in the world run by oaths, it's a, it's a, um, the oath is a conditional curse. What everyone felt like from the Greco-Roman world all through medieval Europe up until the witness stand with your hand on a Bible is that the appeal was a person saying, when they made an oath, they were saying, I'm inviting God's judgment and punishment if I'm not telling the truth. That's why it's staking God's honor on our word. I'm inviting God's punishment. And the, the literature and the tracts that were disseminated throughout Europe when they were trying to put perjury in, in its proper place all talked about this issue of inviting wrath on yourself if you, if you lied under oath, if you perjured yourself. And so it was always seen as this way of holding people to their word. It was like the old world's version of a contract. And it's not just the pagan world. In Numbers chapter 5 and verse 20, we have the oath of an adulteress. And as a side note, you know, when I, I'm a big advocate for the Apocrypha. And a lot of times when I talk about the Apocrypha, people say, oh, Tobit is so weird. Read Numbers chapter 5. This, the oath of an adulteress was that she would come, if she was accused of adultery, a man would bring his wife to the priest, and she would make an oath and give an offering, and that offering was burned, and those ashes were mixed with water, and she would drink that water, and if she was lying under oath, she would have all these, she would be cursed. Her, her insides would rot out, her belly would swell, and her thigh would rot, was what number says. And so there's this process for making an oath, and it's a conditional curse that she puts on herself in front of the priest. If I'm lying, then my belly will swell and my thigh will rot. And she would drink those ash, that ash water, and that would, that would prove whether her oath would stand or not. And so even, even the, the Jewish world had these issues at hand. And when, when you look at the Anabaptist um, and Quaker arguments against oath-making, what they, what they often say, especially to the church powers, is that you can say that oath-making is biblical, but it is not Christian. They're making this argument that, yes, it is in the Bible. Numbers has an oath for an adulteress. But Jesus said, you have heard, it was said by them, that thou shalt forswear, not forswear thyself, but shalt perform to the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not. So they, they held up Jesus' commandment above those other instances. I said before that this issue of substitute honor is more common than we might think. And I thought a lot about it. I was trying to find some examples of places where I've seen this happen. And one of the historical examples I thought of um, in, the, in the history of the German Baptist people when they came to, to Pennsylvania and to Germantown, there were two rival factions that came over. One of them was run by a man by the name of Robert Afreda, who ended up in effort in the cloister. And he was a very, very ascetic person. There was like a neo-monasticism. The German Baptist history, back in when it started, they had experimented with all kinds of truths. They had tried all kinds of things. They'd tried a common purse. They'd tried marital celibacy. As a small, nascent community, they tried a bunch of different things. And some of them they changed. They said, no, that doesn't work. We're not doing that. We're doing something else. Well, by the time they come to the U.S., Efreda and his people have this really rigid, really ascetic form of, of their faith. And there, he claims again and again in his letters, and there's a contest between, there's a dispute between these two groups. And he claims, I'm the one who is doing things the way that Mac did it. I'm the one that's doing it the original way. I'm the one that comes from the original source. I'm the one that's doing it like we were told to do. And the other side says, no, we are, you're not, you're doing something different. And this dispute, it, it's a good example of what I think is a common version of where we still try to make oaths. Like, he's not appealing to his own 
teaching, his own perspective. He's borrowing credibility from Alexander Mack and trying to use it to get people to listen to him. And you might not listen to me, but we have this common person that we respect, and so I'll use his name and put it in front of you so that you'll listen to me. And this is a kind of, this is, has potential to be a kind of swearing of oaths. Now, what differentiates this? This is what I asked myself in wrestling through this this morning as I was preparing. There is something about, about confirming your word. There is something about uh, rhetoric and, and argument. So when Jesus says, if you don't believe my words, believe me for my work's sake, is that swearing of an oath? No, because it's his, still him standing on his own actions. It's if, if you can't trust what's coming out of my mouth, then look at what's coming out of my life. That's a differentiation. Paul says, um, Paul makes similar uh, appeals to how his, his argument, how his direction is rooted in the scriptures. He's confirming what he's saying because it comes from here. Like I'm making a connection between me and the scriptures and I want you to look at the scriptures and evaluate them on their own merit and see if what I'm saying lines up with that. And I think that's different than what we're talking about. That's not a substituted, that's a, that's a derivative. Like it con- this comes from the scriptures is different than me using somebody else's honor, someone else's reputation and putting it in front that you're supposed to listen to that if you won't listen to me. I think that um, in all of this, we should be training ourselves in the way that we speak to be sensitive to this, to, to standing on our own two feet when we make claims, when we, make, um, when we, when we ask for people to listen to us, that, that, that we, should, we should train ourselves to be sensitive to this substitute honor, trying to stand in something else. I was interested, one, uh, one person I looked up this text, he had said that this statement of Jesus is a command for transparently honest speech. And here again, we interact with this idea that the disciples do not have two forms of communicating. There's not a normal way that we ha- talk to one another and then a way under oath where we're really serious about telling the truth. Those two things are supposed to merge into one category for the disciple. What Jesus is doing with you and with me is he's saying there's only one way that we talk. And he also gives a warning. He said there's one way that we talk and whatsoever is more than this comes of evil. Or some of the newer translations say from the evil one. Whichever way you read that, it's a bad deal. Whatever isn't me saying what I mean and meaning what I say comes from a bad place. This, this tradition of taking Jesus seriously at these things, I mentioned some of the European context, but there's, there's a good pedigree in the early martyrs and early faithful Christians as well. Apollonius in the second century said, Christians have been ordered by Jesus never to swear and in all things to tell the truth. Listen to this. For from deceit comes distrust and through distrust, in turn, comes the oath. The oath is a way of solving a problem. Getting people to swear oaths or to commit themselves to some other system of honor is solving a problem of distrust. But it's the wrong solution. A lot of the early Christians make these claims and pay a price for not swearing oaths in the, in, in the Roman world. But as, as Christendom takes root in the Roman Empire and becomes legitimized and then enforced, um, oath-making becomes important again, even in the church. And some of some of the prophets in the church have bemoaned that rise of the use of oath-making. Chrysostom is one of those 
as he's complaining about the rampant oath-making that's happening in his day. He says, whether you're buying vegetables or arguing over two obols or threatening your servants in your anger, you always call on God as your witness. And he's rebuking people for turning to oath-making in just common speech. It's a, it had become just part and parcel of talking again. There's a lot of really interesting things to read about that. If you're interested, there's, there's some brilliant discourse written about these verses throughout the centuries that are worth reading. But all of it begs the question of why do we do this? <clears throat> and it's a bigger question of why, why do we have this need? I mentioned that Apollonius quote where he says that dist- from distrust arises the oath. Why do we have so much distrust? Why do, we appe- why do you lie? That's a good question to ask. I, I, I have lied in the past. I presume that you have as well. What, what does that come from? What's the source of not telling the truth? Where, where do we find the broken part of us that puts out a lie instead of a truth? And what is that? And what does that mean? And why is it bad? Why is it bad to tell a lie? Let's assume that nobody gets hurt. We're not talking about lying about robbing a bank or something. Why is it bad to lie no matter what the lie is about? Why is it bad to lie if somebody tells you that, if somebody asks you if you love love supper tonight at their house? I had a... (laughs) I, why is a white lie bad? That's a good question. That's a good way to say it. Why is a white lie bad? Something that you say that you consider that would be considered a good lie. And why do we do that? See, I read somewhere one time, somebody said that A lie, any lie, is an unreal. It's a a not true, right? So that seems kind of dumb, like of course it's a not true. But not true and not real are the same thing. And so whenever I tell a lie, whatever it's about, whenever, whenever I tell a lie, there's two big problems that arise. And I don't care how innocuous the lie is. I don't care if it's about Santa Claus to a child or whatever it is or, or someone you liking their meal or whatever it is, wherever you tell a lie. And, and I will define a lie as saying something that you know is not true. Okay? Saying something that you know is not true. There's tons of social expectations to say things that aren't true. We, we live in a world, and I think men always have because I see it in history, where there are social reasons where you're expected to tell something that you don't believe is true for the sake of social order, for the sake of being polite, for the sake of getting along, for the sake of making people feel good, for the sake of a lot of things. The world has customs and expectations on our speech that sometimes we're expected to tell untruths, tell, say things that we don't believe are true. And it's easier, right? It's easier sometimes to just go along with the flow, to not make waves, to not make people feel uncomfortable, to not say something because the truth is sometimes uncomfortable. So here's the two problems with telling even a white lie. One is that you make, you betray reality. Like, I've learned to think of, of, of lies as, even white lies, as conspiring to break the world. So the world is. It is the way that it is. The, the tablecloth is green and my shirt is orange and we are here and it's this temperature and all these are just truths. They just are. And when I lie, it's like a magician's trick. It's like me trying to convince you that what is, is not. And something that is not, is. And, in, and when I do that, when I practice a lie, when I practice telling an untruth, I try to create something in the world that's not real. And the problem is that over time, as I, as I do that, 
the way that we talk is also the way that we think because our, our words, they come from our, our, our minds. And so the way that we talk comes from how we think. And so as, if you practice lying to get along with people, to not make waves, to make people feel comfortable around you, when you practice making those unrealities and passing them off like a magician pulling a trick, like you're saying something that's not real and putting it into the air and trying to make this space that's not real, you develop a way of thinking that is based off of that practice. You habitualize unreal thinking. And so what happens is that, that the expediency of that practice becomes more and more useful. Well, it's, if it works for this, then it also, if it works for when I want to make somebody feel comfortable, then it also works with if I'm running a little bit late, right? I, that doesn't, I'm not hurting anybody if I'm five minutes late. I just say, hey, I'm on my way, but I'm still in my bathroom brushing my teeth. And I've created this little bubble of unreality, but it's an expedient, right? It, it smooths out our relationship. It makes you not upset with me, and it allows us to keep going forward. And there's a utility behind why I lie. And so when that happens and that works and there's no consequence, then the next time I'm in a place where I'm between a rock and a hard place, I can use that unreal thinking. And you can, do, you can cast so many of those spells. You can make so so many of those little pieces of magic in the world that are based off of an illusion, that are based off of the unreal, that you get caught in your own world and you eventually will lose the capacity to tell truth from a lie. The biggest problem for people that lie is not that they deceive other people. The real problem for the liar is when he has deceived himself. And you will eventually, if you practice that, if you hone that capacity to do that, you will eventually not be able to discern yourself. And I meet people from time to time who, who struggle with lying, and they don't know how they feel or think about things themselves because they have passed off so many falsehoods that they can't distinguish between what's true and what's not. And you ask them, how do you feel about this or that? I don't, I'm not sure. Sometimes I feel this way, sometimes I feel that way. Sometimes I think this, sometimes I think that. They've lost touch that don't know how to tell what's real anymore. That, that sounds like a big thing. It sounds, like, it sounds like a kind of mania, right? Like I'm describing a crazy person. I'm not describing a crazy person. I'm describing people who live constantly trying to please people with their words and say things that people want to hear, and they end up in a place where they don't know up from down. They don't know right from wrong. They don't know how they feel about something because they haven't told enough truth or they've told too many lies. For the, sake of, for the sake of getting along, for the sake of expediency, for the sake of not having problems, for the sake of the fear of man, for the sake of whatever you want. But you practice not telling the truth and you'll lose grip with what's true. We tell lies because we want to be believed. We tell lies because sometimes the ends justify the means. We think it makes, it's less trouble. It's easier. And I think that That principle of not living in the true, not, not being willing to pay the price to have the world be true, right? That's what it is because all those social instances, all those times and places where it's easier to pass off an unreality, it's easier to say what's expedient, it's easier to get along than to say what's true. All of those times, they, they, they catch up to you. They have to, right? Like, you can only live in the false world so long until it starts to crumble in on itself because a false world can't sustain itself. The real world can sustain itself. It's made by God. It is. And that's the beautiful thing. It just is. It's why all truth is connected to God. And all lies are the opposite of God. 
All lies are the opposite of God because they're the opposite of real because they're the opposite of truth. How do we... Um, how do we... Jesus says that whatsoever is more than this cometh of evil. It feels, at first blush, it feels like an exaggeration, right? You're like, you're just talking about an oath. And we see that there's a problem there, but is it really like it's either evil or the truth? Is that the only two options? And according to Jesus, it is. It's either evil or the truth. Whatsoever is more than this cometh of evil. So let me talk about a common way that this happens. There's some slight between you and I. You do something that offends me or that's... You, you break something, you steal something, you do something, you do something to me. Maybe it's just a social inconvenience. Maybe you're late to a meeting. Maybe you're... Whatever it is, pick however small or big you want it to be. But there's some slight between you and I. And you come and you say, hey, I'm sorry, that shouldn't have happened. And I say, it's fine, don't worry about it. Why did I say it's fine, don't worry about it? Well, there's two reasons. Two potential reasons why I say it's fine, don't worry about it. Either it's fine, don't worry about it. Or I don't want to have a confrontation about that issue. I don't want to have conflict. And so I say it's fine. Those are the two options. Behind that, those are two rationales behind that statement. Now, it's let me say this: it's good to cover over a transgression, for out of love to say, "Don't." It doesn't matter. It really. I know that your child broke my couch, but it doesn't matter. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Really, it's fine. That's a good and a right thing. It's good to cover over a transgression. It's good to absorb thing. It's good to to make peace and to be willing to sacrifice for the good of a relationship. All of that's wonderful. And, and I encourage it. Wherever we can, as much as we can, we should cover over faults. It's a healthy way for a community, for a family to act. Like, I, it, it's okay. I'm, I'm not offended. It'll be fine. Don't worry about it. It's forgiven already. That's a good and healthy thing to do. What comes of evil is when you say all those things but you don't actually mean them. And when that happens, then this whole cascading chain of events happens. What happens is that then the next time something happens, you, have, you, you still have one that's stuck in your craw. You still have one that's stuck in your throat. It's in the back of your mind. It's in the back of your heart. I knew he was going to do that again. I knew this would happen again. I know he's always that way. And then you hear about that happening with somebody else over on the other side. You know, brother so-and-so has a problem with brother so-and-so. And see, I know he's always that way. That just always happens. I know he's like that. And then you see him and you're like, hey, how are you? Smiles and everything's wonderful and I'm so glad to see you. But you have all this stuff in your heart. Because you've created an unreality, and the, unre the only person stuck in the unreality is you. You deceived yourself. And eventually that will come out. Eventually it will blow up. Eventually it won't be sustainable. Eventually you won't be able to hold that fiction with reality. The cognitive dissonance will grow too much, and it will be a bad thing when it comes out. It will come of evil. It will create schism and division and anger and strife and all kinds of bad things. Because Jesus means what he says. We cannot practice untruth. What we say, we have to mean. And so... And so when you're in that situation and you feel that impulse and somebody's done you wrong and everything and you're a non-conflict oriented person, you just want to get along with everybody and you just want to be at peace and you say, 
you're tempted to say, it's fine, don't worry about it, I'm glad we dealt with this, it's all okay. When you're tempted to say that, you have to go the other way. And you have to say, if you can't actually say that, if you can't say it and mean it, then you have to have the conversation. You have to say, hey, brother, it's not okay. It bothers me that this happened. I'm not happy about this. I'm struggling with how this went down. I'm feeling like you don't care about me. I'm feeling like I'm being taken advantage of. I'm feeling like whatever you're feeling like. It is always better to have a conversation based on truth than to have peace based on lies. Always. And I know that dispositions, uh, temperaments in, in, get into this, and some people have more trouble with that than others. It doesn't matter what your temperament is. I love you, but it doesn't matter what your temperament is. It doesn't matter how conflict averse you are. It doesn't matter. Because Jesus said, we have to mean what we say. And you can be as gracious and tolerant and long-suffering as you want to be, and God bless you for it, but you can't say those words and not mean them. Because if you do, it comes, from, it comes to evil. How do we, how do we, how do we be truth-tellers? What gets in the way? I want some practical examples of things we can do to be better at telling the truth. To, 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 make, to make a way around like the social, the sociability that all of us have expected. Like when, I mean, it's even little stuff. I, I think the little things matter. I, I hope, and I, I think that this is common among us, when we ask each other, how are you doing? that we actually want to know, that we're open to having a conversation about that, that we don't just, that, that we're not using these things as like just a hello, that we're having conversations when we talk. If you don't want to have that conversation, don't ask that question. If you just want to say hello, then just say hello. If you just want to, if you want to bypass that, if you're not ready to have that conversation, if you don't want to talk about how you're doing, just say greetings. There's other ways you can talk. You don't have to ask people questions that you don't want to actually have a conversation about. It's just a, there's habits that we form around this stuff that creates bad outcomes. And we need to be mindful of that. And when, when somebody asks me, how are you? Either say, I'm not ready to talk about that right now. I'm struggling. Or I'm okay. Or things are well. Or, and I know you don't, you don't have time for, to pour out your heart when you're passing in the driveway. That's fine, but don't tell untruths. There's a lot of things you can say that aren't, don't default to these, these idioms and these expressions. That's one of the things. Don't use idioms. Um, I don't mean don't ever use idioms. I mean don't use them in these kind of conversations. What I mean by that is this, like, um, here's some idioms that are red flags to me now. And I use them. I, you'll catch me saying them, and you can call me out when you do when you hear me say them, but I know that they're, they're marks of this, of this issue that, I, that I'm talking about. Here's some idioms. Honestly, honestly, I, I want to tell you, whatever. Well, why do you got to say honestly? I'm assuming you're honest until you, like, until you said honestly. Now I think you're not being honest. <laughs> Frankly, sincerely, like in all honesty, I feel this way. Well, how did you... What, what about before you said in all honesty? Were you being deceitful before you said in all honesty? Like, why do we have to catch, why do we have to use those idiomatic expressions? It's, it's the same thing as the oath, right? It's a way of throwing something in there that says, at other times you may not be taking me seriously, but right now I'm really telling you the truth. Even that one, to tell the truth... I don't know how many times I've seen somebody get pulled over by the police and they say, well, to tell the truth, to tell you the truth, I was going five miles over the speed limit. Well, why do you say that? Like, it's a funny expression to use. It's a funny idiom to put into as a, as a caveat for something that I'm going to say. How we, again, how we talk is how we think. 
So don't use those kinds of idioms. Another way to be truth-telling people is to have conversations in two parts. What I mean by that is when we're talking, when we have a conversation, and I'm thinking particularly in agape, but in, in, in any place where we're, we're having real conversations among us, a place where we're often tempted to not tell the truth or not tell the whole truth. It's interesting, right, in that old witness example, they say, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Like they were trying to catch all the bases. Because you can tell part of the truth, and it's not the whole truth. You can tell the truth and some other stuff, and both of those equal lies. But the, on the witness stand, they tried to couch, they tried to pin people down enough to say, I just want the truth from you in the witness stand. And we're witnesses for Christ, okay? We should always be in that place. We should always be in that place that we're the truth tellers. So it was the same. Conversations are two parts. Where we often, where we often uh, get into trouble is not telling the whole truth. So um, if I was gonna if I was gonna make a confession to you, and I was gonna say. Eric and I were, we didn't get along well this week, and I just want to confess that to you all. A healthy way to have a two-sided conversation is for you to ask me, what do you mean by that? What does it mean that you weren't getting along? It's not enough information to really know what's happening. What do you mean you didn't get along? Does that mean you... I mean, did you start yelling at each other? Were people slamming doors? Were people throwing stuff? What, what does it mean you weren't getting along? And create an expectation that when we talk, we tell the truth. We tell what there is to tell. And the places where it's hardest to tell the truth is when it's something that's bad, when it's something that's not pretty, when it's something that we wouldn't, that we would be tend, we would tend to want to re- conceal or hold away or hide from view. Of all the places, and especially when we're when we're doing something like confessing our faults to one another, this is the place to really open things up. I um, <coughs> I was watching things I shouldn't have. Well, what does that mean? What are those things? Are we talking, like, what are we talking about? And, and sometimes, like, I think there's an, until we practice telling the truth, there's an impulse inside of us, like, we want to say, we want, to, we want the absolution, we want to be absolved, we want to come clean, we want to share our faults with each other, but we do it kind of tentatively, like, we'll give a little bit out, but hold a little bit back, because it's a little too raw to say the whole thing, and so we just... We share a little bit, and then we think that we'll feel okay, we'll feel better, because we're not hiding it right, but we haven't told the whole truth. And so we can create spaces, and we can create conversations where we expect each other to tell the whole truth. Come out with the whole thing. If there's something you need to get off your chest, then get it off. Like, don't go halfway with this stuff. Tell the whole truth. Let it all out. Asking each other, what do you mean by that? Understanding, like, in, instead of just these short, you know, back and forth, really, uh, we want to know each other, and we want to be known by each other, and we want to have, we want to we be able to share what's real about us with each other. This is the important thing that we're supposed to be doing in the church, is to really know and be known by God and by each other. And that requires a kind of honesty that isn't natural to people. It's not the thing that you would do left to your own. You have to go against something inside of you to really be honest and to be a truth teller. A truth teller, the most rare person is the person who can tell the truth about himself. It's not terribly hard for me to tell the truth about other people. We're all pretty precise at that at that task. 
But telling the truth about yourself, that's hard. That requires a real commitment to truth. A way to be truth tellers that sometimes we miss is I, I, don't use jokes and sarcasm to make points with people. I'm as jocular as anybody. I think people that know me know that. Like, I don't mind having a good time. I love to laugh. But if there's something, if there's a point that you need to make somebody, to somebody, if there's something, sarcasm is like, it, it means to tear the flesh. That's what the words come from. Sarcasm is a backhanded way to make a point very often. You say something that you've been wanting to say for a long time and you say it in a funny way so you can pass it off so you can finally get that thing off your chest that you been wanting to tell brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so and you use a joke or sarcasm in order to make a point and it, it does tear people. And it, it, there's some, some of us have a propensity to do that and I don't, I don't know all what it is. I think it's just an easier way. Like if it's funny then I can make a point and we can kind of laugh it off, but there's a little bit of a sting there that sticks and hopefully they'll get the point. And that's a really destructive way to communicate. And young people, I, I know that I used to, I've, I've learned this lesson over and over again and I, I still have to remind myself, but I think especially young people do that with each other. I, I know when I was younger, my close friends, we would always dig at each other with these jokes or sarcastic comments, and it was, a way to, it was a way to prod somebody, and it's not a healthy way to talk. It's not a healthy way to do good things. You can get something off your chest that way, and everybody can give a little chuckle, but it's not anything like actually having a conversation saying, hey, you know, there's something that's been bothering me I'd like to share with you. Because that takes like some, that takes some risk. You're risking the relationship, you're risking confrontation, you're risking your, your place with them, you're risking a lot of things. But it's so much better, because I've, I've watched so many people over the years, somebody say something sarcastic and it's got a bite and a sting behind it, and everybody chuckles, and the person that that was said to gets this kind of grimace on their face. And now I've learned to see it, and it just hurts me, like it's painful. Like that hurts people when we do that. It's not truth-telling. Another thing that's important about truth-telling, I think these are, this is a really important principle, um, the whole subject. Within this subject, truth-telling and being mean are not synonymous. I think sometimes people get into truth mode and it means like you can just tear at people and say mean things and call, pass it off as truth. Truth is not mean. When God tells me truth, it's kind and it's tender and it's gentle because he wants me to change and he wants me to grow and he wants me to understand, he wants me to see, he wants me to have knowledge, he wants me to have wisdom. It's not unkind, it's not uncharitable. Those things are not synonymous with truth. We can be a truth-telling community that is kind and gentle and merciful and respectful. And it's important that we do so. In fact, we are not actually a truth-telling community if we're not those things. It's the longer, harder way to talk. And I think it's why oftentimes we don't. Why oftentimes it's easier to not be truth-tellers. Is that there's shortcuts. There's ways around the long, hard work of telling one another the truth, telling myself the truth, that I can circumvent that with these other tactics that make life feel easier. They, it feels easier in the moment, but it does not create growth. It does not create health. It does not cause us to be what God wants us to be.
I want to wrap up here. Jesus, Jesus is teaching us that we have to, we have to mean what we say. And sometimes that's harder than it appears at face value. It requires a commitment. It requires not taking shortcuts. It requires risking confrontation and holding my desire to be true and obedient to Christ as more important than whatever I, I get out of holding back the truth. I want you all, like my experience, what I want out of my life among you is I want to, I want to be true. I want to see where the false is. I want people around me who will tell me the truth and who love me enough to hear the truth. I want that for our communities. I think that Jesus wants that for our communities. And it means that all of us are called by Jesus that when I say something, it's exactly what I mean. I'm not going to take shortcuts with you. We'll have the confrontation. We'll have the conversation. We'll, ha we'll take the time to be truth tellers to one another. And I'm not going to hold things back. I'm not going to create false realities. I'm not going to... I'm not going to be a magician and try to cast a spell to create some fake world that I can hold up in front of you and get you to believe is real when it's not. I said there's two reasons that lying is bad earlier, and I only mentioned one. The one is that you'll lose touch with truth yourself. But the other one is that it's just as important to me. It's terrible to be deceived. N not a single person has ever been lied to by somebody that they love or somebody that they hate and felt like, oh, I'm glad they lied to me. It hurts to be deceived. It hurts to be lied to. It hurts to think one thing and be living in that fake reality because somebody led you into it. And if you know what that feels like to be lied to, if you know what that feels like to be deceived and to live in a place that isn't real, and how, you know, depending on who it was and what it was about, can be really disorienting to your whole world. And if you know that, then you know why it's wrong to lie. We all do. We have to... We have to be people committed to truth. You know, it's interesting to me when I look at the Sermon on the Mount, we'll end where we began. These are the hard stuff, right? Like, this is the list of things that are the hard sayings of Jesus. These are the things that were worth him highlighting and focusing as the things that his people would be defined by, as the things that were, were going to mark out who was his, the things that we were going to commit to as his disciples, the things he wanted to put his finger on, and this is one of them, that we would be a truth-telling people. In his world, in the world after him, and in the world we inhabit, this is a hard saying. It takes a commitment to Jesus above other things that you could have. In all of these statements about anger, about lust, about truth-telling, about loving your enemies, these are places where Jesus says, I am exerting a right over your life as my disciple. I'm going to tell you what's right and what's wrong. And if you want to be mine, you'll commit to follow me in these things. And so I want to commit trust you to too.